don't know, a fair amount of people must have missed it or uh, not heard. The design worksheet, the excuse me, the planning worksheet was a, and still is, an assignment. It was the first step of the digital scene project. And it is an assignment that you need to do. It is still linked there, just like any other document assignment. You um, open it, make a copy it, complete copy of it, and complete it, and turn it into that assignment on Canvas. Okay. Uh, of the people that handed it in, they definitely heard that. Um, do, put it away. Thank you. The box up here on the right is where you put. I mean, I guess if you didn't do it, but you did, I don't know, a sketch, pencil and paper, take a picture of it or some sort of MS Paint type of thing, but that's what that is. Okay. I know it's kind of like writing your rough draft first and then, or writing your final draft first. And then because rough draft is an assignment, you go through and mess it up so that you have a rough draft. Um, but uh, yeah. All right, so today we are starting a new unit, okay? Uh, just to keep things as confusing as possible, it is unit three again, but it's unit three from 2021, okay? As always, it is from your My Dashboard, from your My Dashboard, you go to current units, Please stop playing with the disk drive. Thank you. And uh, current unit is Intro to App Design 2122. Okay. That's where it will always be. The reason why you need to know is if you need to get back to the old unit three, the digital scene, click up at the top to get to the full curriculum, but then change the year to 1920 and if you forget everything is always listed on the calendar the old new unit was 1920 uh now we're at 2021 and this is the new version of the intro programming thing but they took out that whole turtle drawing digital scene unit and i think there's a lot of benefit which is why we did that but now we are on um intro to app design. So we started out learning about how App Lab works and the dimensions of App Lab and moving turtles around and having functions and um, you know generally controlling things. But now we're going to do more um, design mode stuff and in App Lab, uh, let's see if we can find one that has a good example. App Lab has the, the turtle functions are actually a relatively small part of um, App Lab. A lot of it is in design mode. And this is where you are bringing out your buttons and your text inputs and your drop downs and dimensioning them and naming them and that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, we're going to start with lesson one, and um, we're actually gonna fly through, I think one and two, because one, lesson one is really just a, uh, they give you some example apps. And I mean, there's some, the idea is a lot of like, discuss with a partner. What is the, uh, how do you interact with things? And a lot of this is, user interface stuff, which if you haven't heard that term before, user interface is how the user interacts with something. You could call it user interacting, um, similar to UX user experience, but that's a larger thing. And in this case, it's all buttons back and forth. There's no um, text input or um, drop down or other type of user interface situation. Um, and that's this one app, okay? Uh, other examples, um, and 
I mean, we'll just go over these examples and um, discuss sort of what you would have um, learned. Um, discuss what you would have experienced or discussed with a partner. Okay, second one, bird quiz. We are gonna have some sort of quiz-based app um, where what is the purpose of this app? What is the, how does the user interact? Okay, begin button. Hey, uh, guys, whatever you're clicking a bunch, uh, um, unless you're following along with what we're doing, you don't need to be on the computer. So you good? Good. Okay, so this is just a bird quiz app and um, uh, I guess a hummingbird can fly backwards. And this is what one of the first apps that you're gonna make will be. It's a lot of setting the screen, creating new scenes, new screens that have different elements on them and event handlers. So if the user clicks on one thing, do this. If they click on that, do that, okay? And there's, I think, three more that will just fly through and then a brief video, okay? Um, this one, very similar. It has uh, buttons. The purpose is um, Hamilton, the city of Hamilton, um, main cross streets. I think this one is a little bit unclear. Thank you. Uh, but this basic idea, well, a sound, awesome. This basic idea of a user interface with some icons and jumping around, you will all be well past that shortly. And four, okay. Um, or, uh, excuse, yeah, bubble four. Okay, same question, how does the user interact? Well, uh, there's no clicking there. And um, this appears to, uh, <laughs> fantastic. All these sounds are built into App Lab. And just a general informative app, which like I said, is gonna be, you can have a quiz app for one of your first ones or this general informative about anything um, type of uh, clicker app, which I don't think this one is actually working very well. Uh, oh no, it is, it's just a very small picture. Okay, and let's see, I think this video is not one we've seen before. Yeah, all right, so let's watch this. Screens off, laptops closed, phones away. Keyboard's down, mice down, no clicking is needed. Okay, so um, let's... Uh... My name is Maylee Koo, and I'm a designer and an inventor. And so some of the things I've designed have been at Apple, and now I design products for kids to use so that they can have an easier time in school. My other jobs include DJing and dancing. Computers are everywhere. They're in people's pockets. They're in people's cars. People have them on their wrists. They might be in your backpack right now. But what makes a computer a computer? What does make a computer a computer anyway? And how does it even work? Hi, I'm Nat. I was one of the original designers of the Xbox. I've been working with computers since I was maybe seven years old. Uh, and now I work on virtual reality. As humans, we've always built tools to help us solve problems. Tools like a wheelbarrow, a hammer, or a printing press, or a tractor trailer. All of these inventions helped us with manual work. Hey guys, just be quiet. Just stop talking. There's like three minutes left, okay? And uh, screens off, 
Just now is the time to pay attention. Plenty of time for that. Over time, people began to wonder if a machine could be designed and built to help us with the thinking work we do, like solving equations or tracking the stars in the sky. Rather than moving or manipulating physical things like dirt and stone, these machines would need to be designed to manipulate information. As the pioneers of computer science explored how to design a thinking machine, they realized that it had to perform four different tasks. It would need to take input, store information, process it, and then output the results. Now this might sound simple, but these four things are common to all computers. And that's what makes a computer a computer. The earliest computers were made out of wood and metal with mechanical levers and gears. By the 20th century though, computers started using electrical components. These early computers were really large and really slow. A computer the size of a room might take hours just to do a basic math problem. These machines are things of gleaming, very colored metal and numerous flashing lights. Computers started out as basic calculators, which was already really awesome at the time, and they were only manipulating numbers back then. But now we can use them to talk to each other, we can use them to play games, control robots, and do any crazy thing that you could probably imagine. Modern computers look nothing like those clunky old machines, but they still do these same four things. First, we're gonna talk about input. This is my favorite, because what input is, is the stuff that the world does, or that you do, that makes the computer do stuff. You can tell a computer what to do with a keyboard, you can tell them what to do with a mouse, the microphone, the camera, and now if you're wearing a computer on your wrist, it might listen to your heartbeat, or in your car, it might be listening to what the car is doing, and a touch screen can actually sense your finger, and it takes that as input on what it's doing. All these different inputs give a computer information which is then stored in memory. A computer's processor takes information from memory, it manipulates it or changes it using an algorithm, which is just a series of commands, and then it sends the process information back to be stored in memory again. This continues until the processed information is ready to be output. How a computer outputs information depends on what the computer is designed to do. A computer display can show text, photos, videos, or interactive games, even virtual reality. The output of a computer may even include signals to control a robot. And when computers connect over the internet, the output from one computer becomes the input to another, and vice versa. The computers we use today look really different from the earliest thinking machines. And who knows what the computers of tomorrow will be like, my hope is that you get to help decide what you want the computers of tomorrow to look like. But across all computers, regardless of the different types of technology they use, they're always doing the same four things. They take in information, they store it as data, they process it, and then they output the results. All right, so uh, just to decide, anytime there is a uh, video from code, um, or I should say a lot of the times, I don't know. Um, it'll be up on our slides that has the other videos because sometimes you can't get to code.org videos, I think, um, even though they're just regular YouTube. But, uh, and also if you're watching the replay, um, it's usually super compressed, super lossy compression. Um, let's go ahead and put that there and just be done with it now. And let's go like that. And this is what you uh, knew. Uh, hold on, U3L01 uh, apostrophe 20 dash apostrophe 21. And uh, let's go. Sorry, uh, yeah, I'll do it. All right, so the, where are we? Okay, so um, the second part of this lesson is kind of a waste, not a waste, it's a little bit redundant. 
I should say it's the same five apps, but you're supposed to discuss inputs and outputs. And for all these, the inputs are the same. Uh, choosing a button and the outputs are the screen, uh, the scenes change, the screen changes or on a couple of these things change on the, the starting screen or, you know, just changing like here, this is just a, uh, a filled box that changes based on uh, user um, interface. So we are just gonna jump to lesson two and you can go ahead and load up lesson two. Um, as usual, code does a good job of sort of uh, self-directed things. Um, and I think a lot of these, you are doing some sort of interaction situation as soon as it loads up. Okay, uh, look at that, let me try to move some around. Okay, so on the screen, you'll notice, or on our emulator, you'll notice that there is a new button that wasn't there before, and this is a design mode, okay? And design mode is, I guess, the opposite or the alternative, uh, the counter to code mode, okay? And you'll start to see some new blocks here. These are user, the yellow blocks are user interface controls. And later on, you'll have a bunch of different, like you'll get the turtle commands back and the functions commands and all those things. The most common of these is the event hammer. It reads on event, blue button click, then it is its own function, sort of a, not recursive function, but a self-contained function. And it says, when something happens, do this, okay? And this is where you'll put a lot of your just regular function calls, um, the function calls with the definitions being at the bottom. But here, the point of this is in design mode, you can see what all the different elements are, okay? We will put a lot of focus on this later that, so when you bring out a new element, it gives it a generic name based on, you know, whatever. It is important to name your elements with a descriptive and meaningful name. And I highly recommend including what type of elements it is in the name. Okay, because later on, you're gonna be looking for what element and you're gonna dig through every ele element, including the screen names, uh, the text areas, images, every possible thing, you're gonna have to find that the name, that element ID name in your event handlers. So giving them good names as you move forward is important. But other things that you should take away from this are that for every element, so let's say the color swatch, or uh, how about just the flowers image or icon? Let's get rid of these. You'll see that it has its size, width and height. It has its X and Y position. And in most programming, um, well, we already know that the X position or rather the X value of anything on the screen, X is zero over here and X is 320 over here, that's just for App Lab. Your resolution on a screen will be significantly different. And same thing with Y, Y is zero at the top, yep. and Y 450 at the bottom, okay? And when you're talking about the location, or not the height, the X and Y position, you're always talking about the top left corner of any, any element, okay? So this color swatch, its X and Y coordinates are 65X and 170Y. And you can see if I go to right um, 65 from the left and 170 from the top, and then its height and width are, you know, from that point, that's its width and that's its height. This is useful for getting things to line up and be symmetrical and look good, uh, although, you do always have the option of just sort of dragging things around. 
I think this would be very difficult if you're trying to do this with a touch screen, but I'm not going to try and sell you on getting a mouse anymore. You're, you're on your own, uh, but I can't imagine. Okay, so the point of this bubble is to just go to design mode and see what you can uh, mess up. Okay. And we will take you all the way to the last one and set you on your own. Okay, so here uh, your goal is to change your design elements, your base elements by changing the theme. Okay, you can try to figure out which theme it is. It shouldn't be that hard. Um, it's definitely not that one, but you can see the point of the theme is it changes the default settings for all the different design elements, uh, but you can still change things however you want. Um, every design element has a ton of properties, uh, size, color, fonts, font size. Uh, if it has text, it will have a font size. The screen itself is an element. It doesn't have font. It only has color and image if you want one. When you start to get very complex with a lot of elements, you can select any one of the elements from this drop down over here. And uh, because later on, we'll get to a point where there are elements sort of behind other ones. Or um, let's say I brought in a canvas and it covered up this button. And I can't like click on the button to find it. You can find it through here, but uh, you don't need to do that now. The point of this is just showing you um, some aesthetic stuff that really isn't is neither here nor there. But uh, the point is to just find. Uh, it's not crushed velvet. I don't know. Try to figure out which one is that one. Bubble three. Okay, so um, just as before with the turtle, you could choose colors by the name. Okay, it's called a string. A word in quotes is taken literally by the computer. In this case, it's correlating it to an, its own RGB value. But you can also choose, type in a specific RGB value or most people just sort of go with the color thing because it's not critical, um, but understanding that all of those inputs are um, needed, okay? For this task, your job is to go through and match this picture, this example with, um, hold on, is this the same thing? because there's a different design element in there. No, this is right. Okay, so um, you're just going to go through and button two, we're looking for this color right here. My guess is that they are sort of generic magentas, that sort of thing, or purples but uh, you can just try to go through and find it something like that, a little lighter. Okay, and if you're trying to match things exactly, you can, um, does this give you the RGB value of it? Yeah, there you go. You can match this exactly by doing 216, 56, 237. So this one, which is the other one, I already forgot it. What was it? 215, 36, 237, or something like that. Suppose I could just copy paste the hex. Uh, and it gets kind of crowded here. Let's just copy this and go down here to the other button and find its background color. And we'll go like that. And there we go. It matches exactly. All right. Um, not too worried about getting the rounded corners or the border radius, but that is a thing if you're trying to change 
the appearance of things. Okay, you can see it's sort of rounding over the edges of the text area. I don't think the difference is that huge between the example and the what they give you at the beginning. Um, does it look like the background, the text for this? Okay, so this text area, uh, text areas have size, location, text color. In this case, the background is invisible of this. Okay, if you put in um, a color, it uh, would be have a background and show you the entire thing. Uh, but is this zero, 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 zero? I know that's black. Um, let's go RGBA. There we go. But it was the text color that we wanted to change. There we go. And of the screen. So we just click somewhere. You can see if you mouse over, you can follow the cursor. The cursor not only gives you the XY coordinates of wherever your cursor is, it also gives you the name of the element that your mouse is on top of. Now, this doesn't work if you have something covering up something else and you can't see it. It only shows you the ID of the thing that's visible, but it is super useful. In this case, we want to change the screen and screen is the another word for the back or what they call the background. Um, although it does refer to the entire screen also when you get to discussing on events, um, setting screens, you'll have different screens there, but that will make more sense when we get there. But either way, let's set the background to a purple blue type of color, a little darker. Uh, okay, same thing. So you can change the title, you can change the color of the icon. And I think we're getting kind of close. So go ahead and do that. Um, let me fly through a couple more examples. Okay, and for this one, you are going to bring in a um, bring in your own uh, image. Okay, uh, for this one, you're just going to find a cat picture, and we'll go like this. And I think you can't. There's a couple ways, and this is super useful. You can download the picture, save image, whatever. You can also copy image address. And this is the way most websites work. There's an image stored somewhere on some server. And in the programming, in the actual code, it is just going to reference the that images URL. And in this case, we want to set image one. Let's see, does it let you, where do we do this? Yep, link to image, and you can copy and paste that in there. And it should submit it. You could also do the standard download um, and uh, upload file to your assets, which is fine. But uh, either way, get a uh, cat picture in there. And I know you, you're probably not all the way caught up, but I want to go through this all so that I can put a, a video up so you can get back to it so it's not a huge gap in the middle okay this one your only goal or your only job is to from uh bring out an image and it requires two new images but this one you're not actually finding those icons okay we want to change this image we want to use this the uh use code.org's icons so instead of uploading or putting in a link, you can go to icon. And what is the first one? The first one is the, uh, why won't you work? Is everything broken here? There we go. OK, 
Okay, the first one is sort of the camera and then the film. So we'll make sure we're working with image one because I just dragged it out and clicked on it. And I want to choose the image icon, uh, camera, video camera. There we go. That looks about right, maybe a little bigger. And the other one, the film, let's bring out another image. And if we were doing more actual programming with this, I would make sure to put a good element ID, um, like film icon image, something like that. But for this, we're just working with getting design mode to work. So we'll go to choose an image from icons. And we'll go ahead and choose the film there. It's a little bigger, but that's good for that one. And uh, let's make sure, do I, yeah, okay. Um, yes, all right, so this is the important thing, just like it's important to give your functions useful, descriptive, meaningful names for your own sake to make your life easier. You need to give your design elements useful and descriptive names. Um, Usually, like the name of a button will probably be whatever words, whatever is on the text button. Okay. In this case, the default version for a button comes out will be button number whatever. And that actually will be useful when we get to, um, like, you want to change 100 images, it would be image one through whatever. And, um, doing a loop to a lot of things uh, having that as the default id is useful but we want to make sure that all of our elements um, are easy to find when we go to code mode and uh, try to find you know when we have 10 buttons you want to be able to make sure you're finding the right one so here we need to make this button one Let's go ahead and change its ID to uh, play button. And I do recommend uh, using camel case or technically Pascal case, but it is a good best practice in JavaScript and probably most programming languages to set things up like that. App Lab does let you get away with a few bad habits, but uh, I want you to do it this way. Okay, so the element ID for the play button is just going to be play button. It's different than the text. The text is what the user sees. It's uh, only related in that that's a good name for it. And um, notice you cannot put any spaces in the name. Yep, it doesn't let you put a space. And uh, camel case. Uh, yep, there you go. Descriptive meaningful and good habit. Put whatever type of element it is at the end of the name. That will help. Okay. And I don't think there's anything to do with that, but you need to do that. That should take you about one second. All right, so this one's going to take a little longer. Your job is to recreate this scene. Um, I'm trying to think, do they have... I think you can find... You'll probably have to find your own piano keys. Um, so that's not going to be too hard. Do Google search for piano keys and try to find a picture like that. Uh, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different design elements that you need to bring out. Um, finding a good, does it give you a theme? Yeah, um, I would recommend finding the right theme first so you don't have to change all the colors. I'm pretty sure it's polar. Yeah, looks like polar, but a couple of other differences like border color for this one and border thickness. 
hex color border color for that one is yellow hey guys I, i'm giving you the giving you the answers so uh that was a great time to listen border color and border radius we'll match this one okay so go ahead and do that and um let's see what is the what are you supposed to understand from this i mean we talked about this you don't have to do the check for understanding uh, it is important to have element uh, IDs, to have meaningful names to help you, okay? So go ahead and the assignment is to finish the tasks in lesson two, all right? Go for it. <laughs> 